when we're done. So we honestly, we had no clue what the animal was going to look like that was better designed to live a longer, healthier life. Uh, let me go through some examples of uh, the things that we changed. You'll recognize some of these as problems that you face. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. So this, we wrote this in 2001. So it was 13 years ago. Many of these issues I have now personally had. Um, so I, I sort of felt like it was retribution, you know, for having made this ar argument. Um, so this, uh, this is sort of a classic example of a Darwinian problem this crossing of the food and air passageway in the back of the throat, it's really bad design because we choke uh, frequently on our, our food or, or water. And, um, and, and so this is really a classic example of bad design. We have problems with our ears, uh, with our, our sight. Um, I've, I've lost 50% of the hearing in my left ear and 25% of the hearing in my right ear since, uh, since I wrote this paper. Um, so I'm glad we fixed some of these problems. Um, and then the problems with the eye are classic. So here's what we did. We raised the trachea. You know, there's another species that has a, a, a solution to this uh, problem, and that's the horse. Uh, the horse doesn't necessarily have a raised trachea, but it doesn't have the crossing of the food and the air passage way in the back of the throat. They can drink and breathe at the same time. We can't, we can't do that. One of the prices they have to pay is they... They can't talk. So there would be a price that we would have to pay if we were to do something like this. We increased the si uh, size of the outer ear and we made it mobile and we increased the number of hair cells in the inner ear because that's what we lose with the passage of time. You'll notice, by the way, that our ear was stolen by Avatar. <laughs> if you look at the animals in Avatar, animals, the organisms in Avatar, they took our ears and they made them mobile. You can't tell from the picture. Uh, so basically, we collect sound. This ear collects sound more efficiently because it's larger, which is precisely why when I can't hear well, I go like this. It's the same thing. Um, we use the uh, attachment of the optic nerve to the retina in a squid as an example of a better attachment than the one that we have, which currently goes around. Uh, the retina in a squid, it's a direct attachment. It's a much more stable uh, attachment. Um, here's another example. You know, my, uh, my dad was a plumber. And so I'd show a picture of this to him and I'd say, what do you think? And, and he would say, this is really, this is the design, this, this, this is the design of an amateur, <laughs> of an apprentice. This is a terrible design. Why would you run a tube carrying a liquid through an organ, the prostate, that closes with the passage of time. All of us, all, all, all men have, over the age of 50, have some restricted flow uh, from their prostate. And all, most of us have prostate cancer already. Uh, most of us won't die from it, but it's just one of those slow-growing problems. And I'll point out, by the way, that I think it was about four, four or five years ago I had a kidney stone. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself... Why do we have nerve endings there? <laughs> I don't understand that. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so I had eight days. I'm sure some of you have had kidney stones, and you know this is not pleasant. Um, and so I, I, don't, uh, I don't get it. Uh, that, but this, you know, we wrote this paper before I had the kidney stone, so if I had written it after the kidney stone, I would have removed the nerve endings <laughs> from this, from this tube uh, right here. So this is really bad design. So let's see what this thing, thing looks like. Oh, yeah, we fixed it, by the way. We pulled out the prostate. That was a simple fix. So here's what this animal looks like when, when it's all pieced together. It's basically shorter, uh, lower center of gravity, lower probability of falling. We uh, tilted the upper torso forward about 15 to 20 degrees. We increased muscle mass, bone density. We reversed the knee joint. This was partly my dad's idea. Um, I don't know. You guys have, have basements here with sump pumps? Okay, so you know what sump pumps are. Well, we have the equivalent of sump pumps in our lower extremities that make sure that blood, you know, is successfully moving up the body, right? And, this, and you might imagine this is a pretty important thing for giraffes to have to ensure that, that blood is flowing in uh, one direction up to their head. Um, and so, and then we reversed the knee joint. Uh, this was my idea. Uh, 
just because of the visual, because we can't sort of get our mind around this uh, concept of a reverse knee joint. There's a few species that have uh, the equivalent of a, a reverse knee joint. Um, and then here's the male version. I point out, by the way, that when we saw this picture, we were saying, well, well whose face is that? Um, and the irony was we discovered after the fact that the uh, artist, uh, whose name is Patricia Wynn in New York, that's her face. Um, so we, I, we got to meet her in person and we're going, wow, you look really familiar. <laughs> that's who it was. So we were, we were contacted immediately after this article was published in Scientific American by a biomechanical engineer at the University of Illinois who said, you know, Jay, if you take this animal and you reverse the knee joint, you tilt the upper torso forward 15 to 20 degrees to lower pressure on the, on the back, um, and you put a weight in this thing's hand, it's just going to fall right over. <laughs> and he was right, of course. We wrote the paper not to suggest that we're, we're any better at designing than the design that we have, but to illustrate the point that the, that the design that we have was not intended for long-term use, it was intended for short-term use. And it's a basic uh, message of evolution biology. That's what it was. A lot of people misunderstood and misinterpreted this. All right. So I'm going to do, uh, I, I, don't, I realize I don't have that much time left, and I've, I've got several more messages to get across. So I'm going to concentrate my, my presentation here to just a few more slides. Uh, I've given an entire talk based on this slide alone. So as it turns out, for reasons that will be obvious in a moment, this may be the most important slide that I show you. On the x-axis is age, and the vertical axis is number of deaths, not the death rate. And what this illustrates, um, for those who aren't familiar with life tables, is imagine taking 100,000 babies born during a given year, and you apply to those babies the death rates in that year at all ages. So in this case, we're looking at females in the United States in 1900 and 2014. So the area under the curve is the same. It's 100,000 babies born in each of those years. And you plot out the ages at which they would all die. This is called the distribution of death. This tells you an incredibly powerful story about where we've come from, where we are now, and where we're headed in the future. So I'm going to tell you the whole story in like two minutes. Okay? So look. We had high infant and child mortality. This little bump here, any guess what this is? Right around this age? Maternal mortality, right? Whoops. This is maternal mortality. But if you made it past the first few decades, you had a decent chance of living out into your 60s, 70s, and 80s. What did we do during the 20th century? We dramatically brought down early age mortality, right? This whole area here was brought down dramatically. We pushed out survival into this region of the lifespan here, and we built what I refer to as the mountain of mortality. This is where death occurs now. Death occurs past, primarily past the age of 60, r roughly between the ages of 60 and, and, and 90 to 100. Now, the question is, what, what are the consequences of the approach that we're now taking to attack the diseases that appear in this region of the lifespan. Now here's the dilemma that we put ourselves in. Right? So I said to you earlier, heart disease, cancer, and stroke, that's what's going to take us out. And if we and Alzheimer's disease. And if we can redu and remember, death is a zero sum game. So if you reduce the risk of death from one thing, something else must rise. Some people don't quite realize that. They think it's great. Right? If we cure cancer, I'd love to see a cure for cancer, don't get me wrong. I'd love to see that happen. But a cure for cancer would yield about a three and a half year increase in life expectancy. That's all for a population. And what would it do? It would push this distribution of death a little bit to the right. But the price we would have to pay for a cure for cancer would be an elevated risk of cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's. And if you cure cancer, and cardiovascular disease, most people would experience, would live long enough to get Alzheimer's disease, other related dementias, other problems that we probably can't even anticipate now. So we've created this really unusual dilemma of concentrating mortality, morbidity, disability, and frailty into this region. 
And what are we doing? We're using the old infectious disease model to attack chronic diseases. Right? The infectious disease model is when you get sick, you attack the disease. Once you've succeeded, you then go on and move on to something else. When something else crops up, you attack that. So um, it's, a, it's an approach that we're taking that many of us think needs to be changed. It needs to be supplemented. That now that we live such long lives and we concentrate mortality, morbidity, and disability into this region of the lifespan, and since many of us argue, myself really among them, that we're not really going to push out the tail of this distribution very much, about the only thing we're going to do is concentrate mortality a bit more tightly within this window, we have to realize that there may be a very heavy price we pay for the current medical model of attacking one disease at a time. And that, in fact, the new model that should be promoted, the new model that we're pushing very hard, is one that doesn't just attack one disease at a time. And you'll recognize this from our discussion yesterday, uh, you know, when I was asking you guys this question about, you know, if, if you could take a pill that would lower your risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer, and you were perfectly willing to take that. But you weren't willing to take a pill that would slow your biological process of aging. Well, guess what? An intervention that could slow your biological process of aging would essentially uh, delay and compress morbidity, frailty, and disability into a shorter region of the lifespan and lead to much healthier lives. Not necessarily longer lives, but an extension of the period of healthy life. And research that's going on in the field of aging uh, today, and, and I'm, I'm sure Ralph is going to talk about this in, in greater detail, is not designed to make us live longer. I know there's people who talk about radical life extension or living to 150 or 200 years. Nonsense, in my view. I don't see that happening anytime soon. And I don't even see that as the primary goal of research in the field of aging. The primary goal is quality of life. Exactly. It's to extend the period of healthy life for as long as possible. And that should be, in my view, the primary goal uh, that we're pursuing. So I'm going to pass by uh, I'm going to pass by many of these arguments. That, my, by the way, my colleagues and I published an article on this topic uh, entitled In Pursuit of the Longevity Dividend in the scientists back in, I can't remember when this was, 2006 maybe or 2008, it was 2006. Dan Perry, Rich Miller, and Bob Butler again uh, focusing in on this argument. We're not the first ones to make this, by the way. The argument actually dates back a couple of decades um, suggesting that we should be trying to slow aging. We published another piece in uh, the British Medical Journal uh, promoting this idea on uh, uh, developing a new approach to health promotion and disease prevention. We see this as sort of a Manhattan-style project, something that we should be investing a large sum of money in in an accelerated rate, given the degree to which populations uh, are aging. We pass by this. I'm going to pass by this and, and point out that in a way we're already committed to extending healthy life by all of the money that we spend today on dealing with many of the diseases and disorders that occur. So we spend a lot of money on immunizations. This is one of my favorite pictures, by the way. Um, we spend a lot of money on mechanical devices. We spend an enormous amount in the pharmaceutical industry, surgical procedures. I wouldn't be alive today if weren't for a surgical procedure that I had in my, in my 20s. Early detection of disease. I mean, you know, the amount of money that goes into to treating the diseases and disorders that we experience is enormous. We're not talking about creating the fountain of youth. I point out, by the way, that if you look at any picture of the fountain of youth, the, it's always, the message is always the same. You start out old, you go into the fountain, you come out young, and then you go have sex. <laughs> I'm telling you, you look at, at images of the fountain of youth, it's, it's all the same. I think that's why Viagra is so popular. We're not talking about turning us into younger versions of ourselves. I know there are people who try to make this argument. It's not going to happen. I'm sorry. Um, there's not going to be a pill that you can take that can turn you into the 20-year-old version of yourself. 
I, I wish that was true, but it's not going to happen. We're not talking about stopping aging, even though we were discussing it yesterday. That's not going to happen either. Um, that's that's pretty much uh, out of the uh, out of the realm of possibility. We're also not talking about radical life extension. This woman here, uh, Jean Calmon, lived for 122 years. This is documented. This is the world record holder for human longevity. We're not all going to live as long as Jean Calmon. That's not going to happen either. I'm sorry. You probably wouldn't want to live that long if, if, if frailty and disability is extremely high. We want to live as healthy as we can for as long as we can, and ultimately that's, that's the message. How did she feel about living that long? Hmm? How did she feel about living that long? Jean Calmon loved it. She loved it. She smoked. Believe it or not, she smoked for 100 years. No, no, no. Don't, don't take that as a as an invitation to pick up smoking. Most people who smoke will die earlier than would otherwise have been the case. That's one of the examples of things that we can do to, to harm ourselves. So I want you to take a look at this. If you can't see it in the back, let me show you this cartoon. So this is the, this is the, the concern that some of us have. And that is we live these healthy, we try to adopt these healthy lifestyles. We do the best that we can. And what many of us have suggested is, once we make it out to these older ages, we are still going to experience some level of frailty and disability, and that is inevitable. It doesn't mean it can't be delayed. Diet and exercise are the only equivalent of a fountain of youth that exists today, and it works. It works very effectively. Uh, you know, my, my own father went on an exercise regimen, weightlifting, in his mid-80s, and had an immediate impact on his quality uh, of life. And so there is something that, that can be done. All right, I'm going to stop with this. And there's two th things that I want to show you, and I, I have to do it very quickly. So let me see if I can do this. One is I'm going to show you a video. Is this the video here? I'm going to show you a vid video that explains this whole concept in like two minutes. Uh, using what's called a whiteboard. Uh, and let's see how this works. Oops, all I see is spinning. Does this mean it's not going to work? Nope, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> What was the major medical breakthrough in modern history? Was it anesthesia, antibiotics, or vaccination? Was it the wonders of medical imaging, from x-rays and ultrasounds to CAT scans? Or pacemakers, coronary angioplasty, heart transplants, or genetic engineering? Could it have been drugs like Prozac, statins, or even Viagra? No, it was the discovery and dissemination of basic public health, such as sanitation, hand washing, refrigeration, and indoor living and working environments. Before the 1850s, we didn't understand its importance in warding off communicable diseases. And people died as a result, often in thousands and almost always at very young ages. Public health fundamentally changed what it means to be human. Along with modern medical breakthroughs, it was simple things like clean water and sanitation that helped humans dramatically change the conditions under which we live, enabling us to experience much longer lives and for the first time with great regularity, the biological aging of our bodies. We succeeded in adding 30 years on average to the lives of individuals in many parts of the world over the last century. A dramatic achievement to be sure, but the real question is where does this leave us now? Is there a price we have to pay for the privilege of living longer? The answer is a definitive yes. While communicable diseases once killed us at a young age, today many more people live long enough for the privilege of experiencing chronic degenerative diseases associated with old age. Fragile bones, muscle atrophy, cancer, heart disease, sensory impairments, all signs that the human body was not designed for long-term use. In fact, we may have already reached or in a way actually exceeded the biological limitations of our bodies. When people reach older ages with both mind and body intact, 
It's a wondrous thing to behold. But where one or the other doesn't make it, the result can be devastating. A prolongation of old age, the very thing many of us fear most. Under these conditions, longer lives can be emotionally and financially challenging for the dying as well as family and friends. But aging and old age need not be thought of only as a time of loss and decline. For increasingly larger segments of society, healthy and productive aging is normal, representing a unique opportunity that few people throughout history had an opportunity to experience. A healthy older life can and should be nurtured. Today, a new medical breakthrough stands before us that may be as important as public health a century ago. I believe science is on the verge of discovering a longevity dividend. The health and economic benefits that would accrue to individuals and societies resulting from a successful effort to slow biological aging. Science is not there yet, but if we find a way to extend the period of youthful vigor, even by just a few years, the trade-off of chronic diseases for 30 years of life that public health brought us in the last century will yield a new and more positive way of thinking about aging and the extended lives many of us enjoy. So that's the whole line of reasoning explained in 300 words. And I want to thank Allianz, by the way, for funding the creation of this whiteboard. So there's one last thing I want to show you. Um, in, in theory, it should take 90 seconds. Close current tab. All right. Okay, hopefully this is going to work. All right, so the last thing I want to show you is a, a technology that my colleagues and I, my colleagues and I created that's designed to tap into something that hasn't, has never been done before. And that is to use one piece of information that we know in the field of aging science that is particularly interesting and relevant. And that is, if you happen to look young for your age, chances are you are actually growing old at a slower rate than other people your age. So in other words, the children of long-lived people tend to look younger than other people their age. In other words, aging shows up in your face. So my colleagues and I created a technology that allows us to, to measure the rate at which your face has aged based on your chronological age relative to all other people your age. Now, we put, there's a long story behind this, but we put up, a, we created sort of what I refer to as the light version of this technology for the public, and then there's a much more detailed version that we're, we've created that's for insurance companies. So I'm going to show you the light version, and I'm going to sample this, and I have no idea what the result is going to be because we had a volunteer uh, in the audience um, and you're agreeing to give us, to answer these questions yeah. for us? Okay. So, um, your, the, the website is called facemyage.com. It's free. Anybody can put a picture up. Uh, and so what is your current age? 22. 22. You're at the lower end of our, of our window, time window here. Uh, and I can't control the outcome, so I'm sorry if the, for half the population, it comes up above and half below. And there, you don't have much below. Um, so, and your ethnicity? Asian. Date of birth? Um, July 8th, 1992. By the way, each time I click on something here, it looks simple. It is not simple. We're tapping into a huge database. And each time I click on something, it narrows the database down so that I'm essentially creating a, a table designed specifically to address your specific characteristics. I'm going to upload your photo, which is supposed to be here. So by entering her picture and her data in here, her information is going into a database. Which enables us 
to more accurately assess survival prospects. So what I'm doing now is identifying parts of the face that allow the technology to operate. It's a long story. And then you've got to answer these questions. So, right, each time I click on something, I'm drawing on a different database. Okay, so each time, like I said, each time I clicked on something, so we've now narrowed it down to a very tight uh, database that links specifically to all of these other people across the globe that ha share these characteristics. So here's the answer. I hope it works. Um, there's two error messages, the numbers 16 and 81. So hopefully ne neither of those come up. Let's see what you get. <laughs> 34. <laughs> all right. So um, I didn't mean to laugh. I, 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 didn't, I didn't mean to laugh in that way. But um, so there's actually a couple of reasons why this, this can happen. First of all, it may very well be real. Um, so what, what this does is it, is it basically looks at uh, the eyes, the nose, the lips, the chin, the cheeks, and the forehead. Uh, and if we were to, so it, and it subdivides the face up into a wide variety of small pieces and then compares your face to all other people your age. So what this says is that your face is equivalent to that of the average 34-year-old person. I'm sorry. Um, like I said, I, 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 can't, I can't control that. It also could be the lighting. So remember I said to you, this issue right here of uh, the shininess on the forehead and the nose could be uh, influencing this to some extent. But it also provides information, and this is accurate, on expected lifespan, probability of surviving to ages 65 and 85. This is based on very detailed uh, life tables. So we're giving you this technology to use for free, and in exchange, we get your data. Right? So I got your picture, and I got your demographic data, and that allows us to improve the algorithm for estimating survival at the individual level. So just so you know, these types of technologies are being worked on. They're available. This is, this is the light version for the public. Um, the more detailed version will include blood chemistry and genetic epidemiology as part of the, uh, the analysis. I'll just leave that up there while, <laughs> while we're, we're, we're talking. So I think I'll, I'll end there. And uh, do we have time for questions? Great. Yes. Of me at 18 to see how long I have. Yeah, actually, so, um, so no, it's it's funny you should ask that. So she said she asked, "Can I put in a picture of me at 18?" And this is actually what we want people to do. So if you have, it has to be a high quality photograph. And if you've got relatives or parents uh, where you have high quality photographs that you could put them in, go ahead, put it in, and see how it actually compares to what the prediction is. But by the way, if you were to put it on a picture of yourself, let's say at the age of 20, and see how long you have, it would be much less accurate than if you put in a picture of yourself today with your current age today, because you've already lived X number of years between 20 and, and where you are, are now, and, and you get actual longevity bonuses for having lived so long already. <laughs> so you really want to put in a picture of, of where you are now. And that will be a much more accurate. The survival estimate is, ex is extraordinarily accurate. Now, keep in mind, this is for populations, not for individuals. So, you know, while this says that she's, she'll live to 84.5, technically what this means is, is that for Caucasian females with this given level of edu education, uh, and there's a couple of other variables that go into the calculation, this is how long people like this tend to live. Half will live longer, half won't just so you're, you're aware of that. Um, but yeah, that was a good, good question to ask. Somebody else had a burning one? Probably the same question I was going to ask about back testing and things like that, which I'm sure you've done. 
yes, we've done some back testing, but we encourage people to play with this. I mean, you know, put in pictures of, of friends and relatives and, and see what, what happens. The technology is million dollar technology. This was developed for the, for the NSA and the FBI. Uh, the facial recognition technology, facial analytics technology. Part of the technology is what you've seen when they take photographs of young people and you want to see what they're going to look like when they're older, if they've been abducted, for example. This, this is part of the technology that we're, we're using here. Uh, so it's very, and we haven't included the age progression part. So in a future part of this website, you'll be able to go in, insert your photograph, and ask, what would I look like 10 years from now or 20 years from now? And then you could ask, what would I look like 10 or 20 years from now if I smoke or if I don't smoke or if I drink or if I don't drink? There's a, a ways in you know, which you can manipulate it. And we're encouraging you to have fun with it and play with it. Yeah. As part of that, if you did that several times during your lifetime, you can actually see the rate. You can look at the rate of change. Yes. That would have we're encouraging people to submit a photograph every year on their birthday. And that will allow you to keep track, and it will allow us to keep track. Uh, so yeah, we, we really are encouraging people to use this uh, for now. And every time somebody goes in and inserts their picture in there, we're using machine learning to improve our estimates of, of uh, survival and facial analytics. And so we, our technology gets smarter every time somebody inputs data into our system. Yes? Of course. Um, don't take into consideration like genealogy and uh, things that would happen in an old age or even divorces and things that happen to you that you don't expect. I mean, so this is the light version. In the more detailed version, the kinds of issues that you're raising will be questions that we will be asking. And we do know what the relationship is between many of these variables and mortality risk. Marital status, by the way, being a critical one, especially for older men. Older men that, are, that have, have a, a spouse or a partner do much, much better than older men that don't. Uh, and so we know the impact of marital status. The effect of education is extraordinary uh, in terms of its impact on uh, health quality and duration of life. Right, it's, it's, it's a proxy for a wide variety of other variables, income, access to health care, and the like. By the way, you can fool the technology. Um, there's two obvious ways to fool the technology. One is with makeup, right? So you, go ahead, put your picture in without makeup and then put another picture in with makeup. And what we've discovered is that the makeup photographs actually lower your face age by anywhere from five to 20 years, which tells you that the cos cosmetics work. And then, um, <laughs> and, 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 no, it won't make you live any longer. Don't misinterpret that. It, it, it'll, it'll, it'll lower your face age, but you'll notice that the expected lifespan won't change at all. Because there's, there's no link between them. Yes? legal, social, like they thought about it. Like what kind of plans are in place to potentially regulate this? Okay, <laughs> so yeah, really good question. So uh, we're going to be introducing uh, genetic epidemiology into this program. So you'll be able, so you can either use the data from 23andMe or you'll be able to use the data from the more detailed uh, uh, genetic analysis, which I'm having done on myself shortly. Um, now, as you might imagine, insurance companies we be particularly interested in this. But uh, in all likelihood, it will be illegal for insurance companies to require this as part of their underwriting process. But it may be possible for insurance companies to accept the information if you are willing to give it to them. Well, so when I've been advising insurance companies on this, I said, look, just so you know, you're going to get a, a biased sample here. I said, the only people that are going to be sending you information are going to be the ones that will benefit from it. So just so, you're, just so the insurance companies are aware of that, and that's okay with them. You know, if they get people that are likely to be long-lived, it's good for them. They can lower the premiums. Uh, you know, it's... it's